species of fig tree, there are several, but they still grow on the Mount of Olives. And in fact, on the Mount of Olives, Hadazayatim, there are gardens overlooking the Kidron where there are trees that those who are experts in such things tell us are over 2,000 years old. You can go to trees that would have been there in the time of Jesus. Actual trees that are still there that would have been there in the area of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. These olive trees are there, but they grow in the same place as the fig trees. The fig trees of this species, if properly cultivated, had three harvests. They had one harvest that would have been early June, one late August, and a third that would have been in December, Hanukkah time. Okay. But if properly cultivated, if properly cultivated, the winter ones would have lasted to spring if the trees were properly cultivated. And of course by that time they would have been very, very sweet. But they didn't last. It was not yet the season for the spring ones, but there was none left from the December har harvest. The leaves were there, but no fruit. I'd like to look at the two parables of the kingdom in conclusion. The one that encourages me the most but also the one that I wouldn't necessarily say scares me or troubles me. Perhaps admonition is a better term. <coughs> Turn with me please to the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 21. These two parables are juxtaposed against each other and verse 43 identifies them as parables of the kingdom. Again, there are other parables that are not parables of the kingdom. Jesus is challenged by the religious authorities and he says, I'll answer your question, providing you can answer me a question. Was the baptism of John of God or not? Now again, the law and prophets are preached until John. When they couldn't answer because of fear of the people, Jesus said, then I can't answer you. What did he mean? Some of you know from our tapes what he meant was, if you cannot accept the teaching of John, you cannot possibly accept the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom is what John preached. Mm -hmm. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. The law and prophets are preached until John. If you don't understand the conviction of sin, save yourself from this accursed generation, there's no way you can follow Jesus. If you can't accept the baptism of John, you cannot accept the baptism of Christ. The baptism of John was a baptism unto repentance. One of the things that's sickened me the most is what's happened in more recent years. I had a born again experience through a cult called the Children of God, but that whole group was crazy and I backslid and it was, I met the Lord, but everything was crazy. It was just totally a cult. Then I got involved with another crazy group, but finally I really came to terms with God. I met some friends, I met some people in Jews for Jesus who became my friends and I began to get my head straightened out or God began to straighten it out. And I've been shacking up with my girlfriend across the street from the United Nations in New York. I was on drugs. Now I understood the gospel. Now there was no the crazy hippie things and all this not really understanding. Now it wasn't like the children of God. This was, I really understood now. 
and the Lord wanted a commitment. But I literally took my drugs, some of you know this, on my pay, and I literally threw them out the window. I, 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 20 stories down in front of the UN, I, I threw my dope out the window. The leader of Jews for Jesus in New York at that time, now he's with another, he's the leader of a Messianic Fellowship in, in the American South now. His name was Sam, and, he's, and he said to me, look, you guys either have to get married or stop cohabitating. You cannot shack up with this girl if you're not married in Christ. Now our relationship had been based on two things. She was Italian, and as a self-evident, the first, as I tell people, was Fettuccine Alfredo. That is self-evident. Boy, can Italian girls cook. The other thing was sexual immorality. That's what the relationship was based on. That's what it was based on, fornication. I was told directly, you can't do this. Repent. You cannot shack up with this trick anymore. Well, we talked then. You can't do this. You're not loving her, you're defiling her. You're violating her. It's not your wife. You can't do this. No drugs, no cigarettes, no immorality. You don't live this way if you follow Jesus. It was clear. There was a baptism of repentance. You gotta stop living this way. You wanna enter the kingdom, you don't live this way anymore. Christians don't go to betting shops they don't smoke cigarettes, they don't get drunk, they don't shack up. The only vices most Christians have is that they're digging their own grave with a knife and fork. <laughs> Especially in America, Canada, and Australia, but it's coming here quickly. It was clear you can't live that way. In a book, The Purpose Driven, you have The Purpose Driven Church, A Purpose Driven Life, it actually says this, if you see someone living immorally, taking drugs, into substance abuse, don't tell them they need to repent. That'll burn them off. We have to be seeker sensitive. Just tell people they need to get Jesus in their life. Once Jesus comes into their life, then God will clean them up. They are confusing justification with sanctification. It's true that Jesus continues cleaning us up after we get saved. But unless you're willing to clean up, you're not going to get saved. The gospel itself is being fundamentally undermined by people like Rick Warren. And churches and pastors are buying into it. There's no repentance. If you can't accept it, preaching of John, repent, the kingdom is at hand, you can't possibly accept Jesus. You can't enter that kingdom if you don't see a need to repent to get into it. Now believe me, I dropped my cross more times than I can count. No, I am not what I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. When you look at your life as a believer, month to month, year to year, you don't see much progress. But when you look back to what you were before you were a believer, if you are a believer, you're going to see two different people. Yes. This is being taken away. By who? By the church. This is terrible. And this brought about a situation where Jesus says, I can't even tell you by what authority I do these things. If you don't understand repentance, if you don't understand why the world is crooked, there's no possible way you can get saved. But then he comes to my favorite parable. My favorite parable of the kingdom. Verse 28, but what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered and said, I will, sir. But he didn't go. 
And he came to the second and said the same thing, but he answered and said, I will not. Yet afterward he regretted it and went. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the latter, and Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax gatherers and harlots will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax gatherers and harlots did believe him, and you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe him. This is quite a situation. The religious establishment saw no need for John's message of repentance, of an imminent kingdom. Well, today, what's being propagated in the church is on a wide scale. Same thing. No need for repentance. No need for preaching an imminent kingdom that's coming. And purpose-driven Wick Warren says, he actually says this, he teaches this. Don't delve into biblical prophecy. Don't focus on that stuff. It's a diversion. Forget about the fact that the book of Revelation is the only book that Jesus said there's a blessing on reading it. Who cares what Jesus Christ said? Who needs Jesus Christ when you have Rick Warren? At a time when prophecy is being fulfilled, when we should be keen to recognize these signs of his coming. They're following a guru who says, don't do it. Israel ran out of steam at that time. There was no more repentance, no more talk of kingdom come. Now the Gentile church has reached that point. Seeker sensitive, no repentance, no talk of kingdom come anymore. Early Pentecostalism was focused on the return of Jesus Christ. But let's look. These two sons, on a corporate level, obviously has to do with Israel and the Gentile nations. Israel gave assent to the Torah, both in the days of Moses and in the days of Joshua. Then again in the days of Ezra. They gave assent to it, but then didn't do it. So the Lord says, the Gentile nations who were pagan, who rejected the true God, now they will come and believe in Jesus. Who is the right son? Somebody who is culturally, biologically, genetically, whatever, anthropologically a Jew? Or someone who believes? <laughs> so you wind up with a faithful remnant of the Jewish people. We've had several here at this conference. Jews who still believe. But then there's the more personal aspect. There's something in all of us that says to the Lord, yes, I will do it, but then we don't. But there's also something in all of us that eventually comes to its senses and says, yes, I will. I suppose everybody has a favorite verse in the New Testament and in the Old Testament or in the Bible. Actually, most people have several favorite, but most people would whittle it down if they had to, to one. If the Lord doesn't come first, what would you want engraved on your epitaph? Well, whatever one you have is one the Lord has given you, if that's what God has impressed on your heart. 
But the one for me is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I only speak here personally. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. No, I am not what I'm going to be, but thank God, by the grace of Jesus, I am not what I used to be. I'm not a campus radical. I'm not a cocaine dealer. I'm not a communist. I was that and worse. Not boasting of it, not proud of it, but that's what I was. No, I'm not what I'm going to be. I say yes, but then I don't do it. I say, no, I'm not going to do this. But ultimately, God tends to have his way. He who began a good work in us will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus when the kingdom comes. That is my favorite parable of the kingdom. But now I will continue with the one immediately following it that causes me the most discomfort. Verse 33, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it again. This is from a Septuagint version of Isaiah 5. He built the tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. And when harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves. They beat one, killed another, and stoned the third, corresponding to the persecution of the Hebrew prophets. But afterwards, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son, of course, Yeshua the Messiah. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They didn't want him to be king of the Jews. They'd rather have a Herod. At least they could do business with him. They'd rather have a Caesar. At least they could do business with him. It's all about business. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these vine growers? And they said to him, he'll bring those wretches to a vineyard, wretched end. He'll rent out the vineyard to other vine growers, corresponding to the Gentile church, who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. And Yeshua said to them, Do you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is from the Hillel Rabbah, Psalm 113 to 118, sung ritually at Passover, as well as the Feast of Tabernacles. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God, the kingdom, the kingdom parable, will be taken from you and given to a nation producing fruit of it. That word nation in Greek, ethnon, translated back to Hebrew, goy. To a goy, producing the fruit of it. He who falls in this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. We only have two choices. We'll either be broken or we'll be crushed. And when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they understood he was speaking about them. It is plural. They didn't just understand this parable, they understood the parables. The Am Ha'aretz didn't know the Midrash. They didn't know the words of the wise and their riddles. They didn't always know the Nimshal. Pharisees did. Sanhedrin did. They understood he was speaking about them. 
They sought to seize him. They feared the multitudes because they held him to be a prophet. Again, it was a political game. Corrupt theocrats will even go further than they're going if they thought they could get away with it. But there are fewer and fewer Christians willing to stand up for the truth, so they are getting away with it. To the point where you have the keynote speaker, the, national, the, the biggest youth minister in the UK, denying substitutionary atonement, denying the gospel and teaching it to Christian youth. A complete heretic, a man sent from hell. A total backslider. If he was ever saved. They knew he spoke it about them. I'm going to give it to a goy. I pointed out several times that by any reasonable barometer of church history, Protestantism is a dying religion in the Western world. It is theologically dead, holding the form of religion but denying the power therein. It is morally dead, condoning homosexual ordination, ordaining lesbians, condoning homosexual adoption, bringing little children up in an unnatural environment, predisposing them to a perverted lifestyle that will reduce their longevity. It's morally dead and theologically dead, therefore it is spiritually dead. Requiem in pace. And I've always marveled at how it's the same Protestant denominations and the World Council of Churches who are condemning Israel that are the same ones who are dating the homosexuals. The Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Reformed Church, the Presbyterians, they are dead, turning their backs on the persecuted church in Islamic countries, but bullying the one country in the Middle East that will protect the rights of Arab Christians. Now I'm distraught at what the religious Jews will do to Messianic Jews, but if I was an Arab Christian in the Middle East, I'd want to live in Israel, <laughs> particularly if I was a born-again Christian. At least I and my family would be safe. I'd have the right to preach the gospel in my community and meet without fear of reprisal for my faith. Morally dead, theologically dead, spiritually dead. Declining numerically. The Methodists close one church a week. I wish they were closing five a week. They're not worthy of the name Wesley. They are not worthy of the name Wesley. Church of England? Don't make me laugh. I can't cry about it. It's too absurd. You have to laugh about it. If anything deserves to be mocked and ridiculed, it's the Church of England. Best thing the Church of England can do for England is drop dead. Tell people, those martyrs who established Anglicanism, yes. <coughs> Tyndale, Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Cranmer, they would be out the door in a minute today. They would rise up against the Church of England today as fast as they rose up against the Church of Rome in the 16th century. Get a copy of the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read it, and you'll realize instantly the Church of England that they established no longer exists. It's easy for me to say that because I'm not an Anglican. But if you were to read Spurgeon's sermons, and you look at the way the Baptist Union has gone, 
churches together in England? If you were to read John Bunyan or William Carey, the Church of England is not alone. The Baptist Church no longer exists. We have churches today, movements, denominations, called the Assemblies of God in Elam. You can hijack a name. You can legally finagle propriety of a church property. But if you don't have the same beliefs, you're not the same church. There are independent churches. There are individual congregations. There are some movements that still have life. The Calvary Chapels from America and the, the Light and Life, there's a move of God among the gypsies. But the gypsies are not part of mainstream society. Never have been. No, by any reasonable barometer. Protestantism is on its way out. Even in America, it's beginning to run on the inertia of what it once was. I mean white Protestantism. The moths are going up left and right. People turning to Eastern religion, to New Age. I cannot understand this. Having been to India, having seen the caste system, having seen cows overfed and children left to go hungry because of a religion, having seen human beings drink water from the Ganges who will die of cholera thinking it's holy, to see people in the civilized world turning to such things. Yet the churches are growing in India. The BJP is persecuting it. I was in India once and they burned a missionary, set him on fire with his family in a car. Didn't stop the churches from growing. The moths go up all over England. They can burn all the churches they want in Indonesia. For every church they burn, two more begin to meet. I've seen Islam losing. I've seen Islam being defeated by a victorious church in Asia. I have to go to Malaysia soon. These churches are growing. But in Indonesia, the biggest Muslim country, they're really growing. It's only here we're losing. Have to go to Africa next month to our orphanages for the AIDS children. The church in Africa has a lot of problems. Poverty, ignorance, a lack of qualified leadership, hucksters who imitate the American televangelists. And in many places, persecution. They have a lot of problems in Africa. But evangelism is not one of them. You don't have to tell a black African there's a God. A black African knows there's a God. You don't have to tell a black African there's a devil. Black African knows there's a devil. All you have to do is tell them how to get away from the devil and get to God. So what happens here in this parable? They knew it was about them. So I'm going to go to the goys. Now it's about us. I'm going to the Asians. I'm going to the Africans. I'm going to the Latin Americans. I have to go to the Philippines in August.
Again, a lot of problems. Poverty, ignorance in the South, Islamic persecution. A rigid opposition from the Roman Catholic Church. A lot of problems in the Philippines. But evangelism isn't one of them. I know a church in the Philippines that was planted. Within 18 months, it had planted five other churches after having been established. Not one of those five churches had less than 200 people in it. After 18 months! I'm going to the Filipinos. The thing is, when somebody tells the truth, when they hear from a Dave Hunt or a Keith Parker or a Tony or an anybody, they know it's about them. <laughs> but it's all about politics, isn't it? It's about theocratic politics. It's about power, it's about money, it's about keeping themselves in pocket and in power. And they can be so religious about it. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. If the church has a future, for the most part, it will not be in the developed world. By the time we got to the second century, the Jewish believers had to realize something after the time of Bar Kokhba's rebellion. They had to come to the realization that if the church has a future, at least in the foreseeable future, it's not going to be a Jewish church. Well now, if the church has a future, it's not going to be a British church. It's not going to be an Anglican church. It's not going to be a European church. It's not going to be a white church. <coughs> if there are white people, they're not going to be Protestants. They're going to be from a Catholic background. You ever notice a Celt is more likely to get saved than an Anglo-Saxon? A Catholic is more likely to get saved than a Protestant? An Asian, a black, a Hispanic are more likely to become Christians? We had that lovely young Christian medical doctor came in visit us last night. Asian man. You know how many Christians in the professions in this country? are Asian. I'm having a hard time getting Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Celtic physicians to stand up on abortion. Mm -hmm. The Asians will do it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation, producing the fruit of it. However, there were Jews who believed. There were Jews who continued to believe, and there are Jews who believe today, and their numbers are growing, just as the New Testament predicts. This itself was a sign of the return of Christ. The natural branches being grafted in is a sign of the return of Jesus in itself. Remnant. I have a hope in this country for gypsies. 
I have a hope in this country for Catholics. I have a hope in this country for Jews. But on what basis do I have any hope for good old Anglo-Saxons? Well, if I'd been a Jewish believer in the first or second century, seeing the temple going to be destroyed, as Jesus and Daniel predicted, of seeing the persecution of Jewish believers by the religious establishment, of seeing the rejection of their Messiah, I'd have to ask myself the same question. What can I hope in? The kingdom will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. There was a remnant of Jews. There is a remnant of Jews. And there is a remnant of Anglo-Saxons. There is a remnant of English people. There is a remnant of Americans. There is a remnant of Canadians, Australians, Kiwis, of Europeans. There is a remnant. Concerning the mainstream denominations of the Protestant world, it's irrefutable that the kingdom is being taken from them and given to another. That is just as clear now as the emergence of Gentile Christianity was at the end of the apostolic age. It's irrefutable. But the news is not all bad. At first, the son said no. But then he said yes. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. <coughs> the Church of England will be scattered like dust. The World Council of Churches will be scattered like dust. The Assemblies of God will be scattered like dust. The United Reformed Church will be scattered like dust. By the grace of God, we won't be scattered like dust. We won't be crushed. Let us instead be broken. Thank you for joining us and God bless.